Good morning, gentlemen. Jay Ross, haven't seen you in like 12 minutes. I know. Leaving the arena, a little fist bump from mm. Sam yesterday. I said, talk to you in the morning. Hey. Yeah. Jay almost, Jay, you know the uh, the Rex Chapman bit on Twitter that the blocker charge oh. virus thing he's always done? Yeah. Yeah, Jay almost uh, had almost. had himself one of them in the hallway last night. Oh. Yeah. I turned in a corner. Some was was moving pretty quick. I almost, I almost, got, I almost got hit. Your cat-like reflexes? Uh, that's why they call me Whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> quick like a cat sam i can't even remember the last time i fist bumped you to game i know that would require you going to games That's good hey point. he's going saturday going saturday first game all right i'll be there you'll be there I'll come be over there. say hi to us i shall um fist full of popcorn like always you know it buddy <laughs> i was you know what i'll bring you into this a little bit uh i saw a lot i was saying there's full context i saw a lot of yesterday morning and uh i was spending yesterday thinking about his his reign as GM. I think Vlade is still beloved in this town, but there's a lot of Vlade slander, as you know. Like, you've dealt with him. Uh, he's like the greatest guy. But I understand that there's, you know, GM Vlade and human Vlade. I get that. But I, I'm like, I'm trying to be defense attorney and, like, go back in retrospect. It's really not a look I've tried. Um, when I go back on his tenure and I start with the fact that, well, 40% of the starting lineup for this Kings team uh, Vlade acquired, whether it was drafting the Aaron Fox, uh, or Justin Jackson for Harrison Barnes. So we can kind of start there. Um, I, I just, I, I, I'm trying to work through my head, Sam, if, as the years go by, if Vlade's tenure as GM, if, if it can be looked at maybe with a little better goggles now than it was when he left. And maybe I'm just biased because I love the guy. I admit it. I think to me, it it really boils down to the Fox factor. Um, I think the Aaron elevating the way he has, uh, it does not erase the choice to not draft Luca, but it certainly takes a lot of the stink off of it. Um, I think, you know, Luca continuing to be a top five, 10 player, depending on your opinion. Um, but, you know, De'Aaron, as of two years ago, in some people's eyes was probably not top 30. Mm. Now De'Aaron pushing to be top 15, top 10 right now, he should be in the MVP conversation. Um, that to me is kind of, you know, if you're trying to you know, kind of polish up Vladi's tenure and look back on it, that's where I would focus. Does it also erase things like, you know, the early kind of cap creating Philly trade, where it appears yeah. that certain rules were not understood, um, you know, and, and, you know, the price that was paid for his inexperience. No, but you know, the Fox and Luca choice was always born out of Vladi's belief in De'Aaron. Uh, and, and that obviously has, has proven to be not as ill-fated a choice as we thought. Yeah. And I think Dave, you were starting to go there about kind of the rationale, at least behind it. And some of it was, Look, what De'Aaron could be may not complement each other very well with Luca. Yeah, and I think what's interesting to me, Sam, is we all automatically go Luca versus Marvin, but I would almost look at it if that was the rationale. What I mean, if they took Jaron Jackson Jr., I mean, just another right. big, a different. It's almost like they, the the pick was yeah, it wasn't Luca, but Trey Young, um, anybody else in that draft almost. But Marvin, I think Jaron Jaron was the only other option at big, and 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 I think most people had Bagley as as good, if not better, a thought. I think Sam, the thought there, just to to back back what 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 Jason's saying is, the thought was Luca was going to need the ball, De'Aaron was going to need the ball. You would have a a, a different version of a Tyrese De'Aaron situation had you drafted Luca. Um, so he was trying to find the Sabonis s counterpart, and by the way. If if he drafts Luca at some point, that's not going to work. Well, you know who's going. It ain't going to be Luca. It's going to be oh, the right. and I, To be honest, Dave, I think it would have been relatively quick. Uh, yeah, Fox, Fox would have been traded like that. Yes, yeah. like that was that was Vladi's mentality. Um, you know, I I don't know if I've shared this on the show in the past. You know, I talked to Vladi years after the move, after he was gone from the Kings, and it struck me. I mean, I'm kind of a sucker for people who have deep belief in things that, you know, they feel strongly about even when the world is saying something different. And, you know, as of, I think it was roughly around when the Bucks and uh, Suns were in the finals, I remember talking to Vlade and 
and him making a comment about Luca and and De'Aaron and essentially saying, listen, not only is De'Aaron getting better, but he's still young. So let's revisit this comparison to Luca a few years down the road. And at the time, if I'm being honest, I got off the phone thinking he was nuts. Right. And, you know, and now, of course, that, that gap is certainly uh, not as wide as it was. Yeah. And if I also remember, guys, I, and I could be wrong on this, I, and maybe it's because of the spot they were in at the time. I mean, you don't get the number two pick that often. They moved up in the lottery. So there's probably other external pressures to really get it right, break this drought that they were still living in. I know that they liked Michael Porter Jr. Yeah. And there was probably fear that, well, can they wait a season to not play the number two pick? Like, that's even another name in hindsight. Yeah. You go, what if they rolled the dice and said, look, we got to eat it for another year, but we might have a guy that could really benefit along with the growth of De'Aaron. No, that's accurate. And they knew all about the back stuff like everybody else. Yeah. Uh, but I, I remember being surprised that they were seriously looking at, at Porter Jr. And, you know, sure, now you look at it and maybe you roll the dice there. I mean, that's the draft. Yep. Um, and they tried to move up. They did try to move up from what I understand. They did try to move up and called Denver and, with and another pick. as he was yeah. slipping, tried to move up and, and Denver was like, yeah, right. Get out of here. But yeah, yeah. yeah they liked it. Uh, so, you know, we, it's funny because we had said, I think if you put out a poll to NBA fans, would you trade De'Aaron Fox for Luka Doncic? Probably seven to eight, if not nine out of 10 NBA fans would trade De'Aaron Fox for Luka Doncic. Now, purple glasses, of course, but I almost think you can directly flip that on its head with Kings fans, Sam, that maybe not nine out of 10, but I think seven to eight out of 10 would say, no, I would not trade De'Aaron Fox for Luka Doncic. And, and that makes it interesting that nobody, the, the thing we always couldn't grasp, Sam, and you, you and I were on this as much as anyone was, how do Vlade Divac and Peja Stojakovic miss on not drafting Luka Doncic? It seemed like it was kismet the whole time, and Vlade knew Luka's dad very, very well. And now you look back, and I don't want to give Vlade too much credit here, but maybe he did know Luka Doncic a little better than everybody else. And now the, the big knock on Luka, right or wrong, is that he he's a... Uh, you know, a James Harden next level guy. He puts up a ton of numbers, but is he a championship caliber player? I'm not saying that's fair or not, but maybe that was part of the thinking process. I hear you. I, I was with you for the most part. I <laughs> knew I lost you <laughs> at the end. Yeah, he lost me. As I'm now for the YouTubers watching me go through my phone, I'm clicking on the standings. Uh, <laughs> the Mavericks are 11 and six. Yeah. They're playing pretty well. It's early. Um, Jason Kidd had himself a press conference the other day. Yes, sure he did. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. ESPN's Tim McMahon, a, a good friend and a guy who I, I love it. Tim is very old school as far as he, he, even if, if he's very friendly with a coach, like Rick Carlisle when he was in Dallas, it was pretty friendly with McMahon, and they would they would mix it up all the time. Like he's he's not afraid to ask tough questions, and so Jason, of course. I told Tim, like, it's okay, write positive stuff. People will yeah. read your articles, you know, yada, yada. But Jason's point was there's plenty of positive things happening in Dallas right now. So I would say to be determined on that front. Um, with Vladi and Luca, I mean, I was trying to think of an analogy that might land, but the idea of of knowing somebody too well, you know, if 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 you know if there was a draft prospect who lived on my street <laughs> and I watched the way that he went and got the mail in the morning and you know, whatever you overanalyze things when you have too much data. And I feel like that uh, happened partly with Vladi and Luca. He, mm -hmm. he projected work ethic issues in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and, and then yes, you know, the ball dominance, I mean, sure. Uh, but you know, Luca is a pretty special player. So, you know, I, I think that part is still there. Okay. We're talking with Sam Amick here on the Folsom Lake Honda hotline. Sam, you were at the last two nights. Um, I don't think really the, the best version of the Kings either night. Now they found a way to win the first game against the Warriors and fans love that. Probably the team needed that. Um, they advanced in the cup. Those were all great things, but didn't back it up with a very strong performance last night. Just curious where you, you see this Kings team right now, good, bad, and kind of the ugly going on with the Kings. Yeah. There, there's sometimes a frustrating watch. And if I feel that way, I can't imagine how the yeah. fans feel because it's so dynamic and explosive when it's right 
Um, but you know, these, these games, like the NBA games are quick. Like if you don't get your SH together quickly, they, they spiral out of control. And so I, I find myself watching the Kings and, and being oh, dogs. Gonna oh, stay oh, doorbell yeah. kids are leaving for the day. Yeah. Um, I find myself watching and, and just going, all right, is, is that version of the Kings going to show up? And to your point, Jason, it really didn't show up that much the past couple of games. Um, I mean, my God, the Warriors game was such a, a unique experience when you talk about the point differential factor. And, uh, you know, Sabonis talked after that game about how knowing that they had to only lose by 11 to get to the knockout rounds almost kept their heads in the game, which is a fascinating psychological thing. And, um, you know, they pulled that one off. They, they looked pretty terrible last night. If you're De'Aaron, I think more so than any other game this season, you're kind of looking left and looking right and going, guys, come on, I need something here. I give you 40 and, you know, Sabonis had a bad night, got completely taken out of the game by Zubats. Um, so, you know, mixed results, um, bounce back from that losing streak really well. And, and I think, you know, we know they're a good team, uh, but inconsistent for sure. Sam Amick with us. And and that is the problem. Keegan Murray missing. That hurts. Yep. Uh, Sabonis has had two really rough nights in a row. And, and Sam, I, I found myself last night. Look, I would have traded. I said this. I'd trade the loss of the Clippers for the win over the Warriors any day of the week. Uh, but even in the win over the Warriors, that was a weird game. 15 missed free throws. Uh, uh, down 24, uh, it, it, it does beg the question, did you think when the Kings beat the Warriors, was that more about the Kings and what they did, or are we also undercutting the fact that the Warriors aren't very good right now? Are they, are they not very good right now in your opinion? Yeah, I still don't. Yeah, the last part I don't subscribe to. Um, I think they're going through some stuff, but I do think maybe hyperbole here that night, felt like and this is a big hypothetical but if the warriors continue to slide like they have recently and if we get to the end of the year and it's underwhelming and and maybe even dysfunctional like they have had in last year and in recent times i feel like this game against sacramento is gonna be a moment that we look back on yeah. um i really do you know i i as you guys know we don't normally in the media get to sit courtside much anymore i got lucky that night and sat courtside and that means like to watch the interactions between draymond and steve kerr and the warriors bench and some of the stuff that was happening and having covered draymond for his entire career um and steph as well i felt like you know the the uh the seams were were starting to bust apart a little bit in terms of their personal dynamics and i think the frustrations that are pretty high level and if they don't get it back under control, uh, I'm always going to remember that night. Uh, I, can you expand on that? Because that's really curious, Sam. I mean, we saw the technical. We saw, I and mean, we know what the the gifts he brings the team. Um, is it? Are you saying it's more detrimental right now? Like, wh where, what did you see there that kind of gives you that potential feeling? I just, I mean, it sounds corny, but like I've generally enjoyed the heck out of covering Draymond, and I like him a lot. I'm just being honest. Watching his energy that night. Um, he, he, he really did, you know, seem to have an incredibly hard time maintaining his emotion, which we know he's dealt with in the past, but it was, it was a different kind of vibe. Um, and to see the way that Steph, you know, Steve Kerr pointed at Steph and this is the part I saw real closely and, and it was just such a, a, a direct thing. And he's telling his guy, go get Draymond. You, you're the only one who can talk to him. And he essentially starts trying to get in his ear I saw a little more pushback from Draymond than I expected on Steph. Um, that didn't seem – it didn't go explosive, but it didn't seem to go as well as I think Steph had hoped. Then by the time Draymond gets to Steve on the sideline, he won't stop talking about the carrying call that he yeah. thought should have been whistled. Then he gets to the bench. He got into it with one of the assistant coaches. He was shouting at some of the players. There was a lot happening. And uh, then you glance over into the corner – where Joe Lacob is sitting, and you would love to know what he's thinking. Um, Mike Dunleavy, their GM, is there as well, and, and that matters to me because, you know, when the Warriors didn't do what they had to do, in my opinion, to hold on to Bob Myers as the head of their front office and one of their leaders and one of the guys that Draymond trusts the most, um, the question then became, you know, is Mike Dunleavy and his influence and his kind of impact enough 
to help keep this group together. Uh, I don't know the answer just yet, but the other night, the vibes were not good. Can we just take a moment, too, to realize that one of the most amazing things we've seen in sports history happened uh, about five years ago that you had Draymond Green and DeMarcus Cousins on the same team, and they actually not only coexisted but got along and bonded, hmm. which I never in my life would have thought that way. And Because and, those are two of the players that are the most emotional and have the most difficult time holding on to their emotions. And I always, you know, and this is this is sloppy of me, Sam. It is, and I, I get that it's not a direct correlation, but I always felt like if Draymond Green and DeMarcus Cousins had each been drafted by the opposite team, if you had DeMarcus on the Warriors and Draymond on the Kings, I always wonder if their careers would have gone the same. But would DeMarcus be sitting with four rings right now, and would Draymond be on the periphery of the league trying to get back in? Yeah, I mean, I don't like that comp I, from a basketball standpoint. Because Draymond's game is all about selflessness mm -hmm. and sacrifice. And, you know, I, I mean, DeMarcus defensively. It's not Draymond Green. Right. Well, but wasn't even willing to do the work. Yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, his ethos as a player, I think, was wildly different. You know, one guy I do think still basketball wise lifts his teammates up. I mean, Draymond is there to be a rising tide in as far as how he plays. But I hear you. I mean, yes, he has benefited from, you know, his landing spot. He has made the most of it. But going back to Saginaw, Michigan State, he was a winner all the way through. Yeah. I, and I, I, I'm still kind of stuck on this struggle the Warriors must live and have been living, Sam, because I think Steph and Clay and Wiggins and Lou, all of them to a man that have been on these championship teams know – what Draymond does for them in a positive way. Know that they he he makes Steph better. He makes those guys better. But those moments that you're talking about, this last game, the the choking incident, they're not. It's not every night, but man, that that struggle's got to be really hard on a day to day basis because it's not always predictable. It's not like okay, here we go. We know what's happening. This is how we handle it. They're all kind of different on a night to night basis inside the season too. Well, and that's where I guess I'll stick with going back to the cousins comp that I said, I didn't like, I mean, yes, that part of it right now does feel a little bit cousins esque when you talk about, you know, people within the organization being on pins and needles, you know, that's not a fun experience. Uh, I don't think it's an everyday thing for the warriors. Um, but just again, that night it's, it's just clear that when push comes to shove this team and really this organization doesn't have anybody, I don't think, that is truly going to get through to him right now. And I think Bob Myers actually was the closest thing to it. Um, I think Steve knows that like, listen, they just gave him four years and a hundred million dollars. They made the choice they made and I understand it. Uh, and again, as I'm a guy who thinks he's a, you know, first ballot hall of famer and, and is a wonderful player. Um, but, and really, if you compare some of the stuff that has happened recently to, earlier Draymond transgressions, I actually think there's a distinction and then these are, are even more troubling. Like if you go back to the suspension game five of the finals, yep. I actually always was on the side of, you know what, if LeBron James steps over me, I might hit him in the nuts too. You know what I <laughs> yeah. mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> like that was not an egregious act. Um, now he got baited and he fell for it. Sure. But you know, absolutely knocking out Jordan Poole and dragging Rudy Gobert 10 feet across the floor um, there's been a bit of an escalation that that is counterintuitive. And this is something that Kenny Smith said on TNT the other day. It's counterintuitive because he's in his 30s with four rings and should not be at this stage right now. Sam Amick joining us. And I want to end the interview this way. You know, I think it's important in journalism and in media because we don't see enough of this. You have to be accountable. And in this day and age of hot takes and, and hot opinions, uh, I think it's important to go back and and chide yourself. Jason, terrible job in this interview by you and me. Do you realize we fell into the very trap that we talked about yesterday? We have a national writer on, and what did we do? We spent more time on the Warriors than we did on the damn Kings. <laughs> we were going off about first take and everybody yesterday and how it was all about how does this affect Steph's legacy and what about Draymond? And we were like, uh, the Kings played last night. And I think Jason's the only one that asked a damn Kings question. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm sorry to jump in. I do uh, love 
I do love our visits when I watch the gymnastics that happen with the two of you who I love so much so that you don't have to talk about the bad game the night before. <laughs> <laughs> that game sucked, Sam. Yeah, it did. It did. And, was... uh, everybody there, I don't I can't in recent memory uh, remember a game where like the media members that had what I called, I, I told one person, I, I was like, it was like in-season tournament hangover. That's what it was. Like, Everyone was hung over. I mean, and even from like, I was exhausted. Like I played in the game. Hmm. Um, everybody seemed to have that vibe. And yeah, it was, it was not a good game for your home team. By the way, just quick to point out as we uh, break here, what a great week for Tim's and media. You mentioned McMahon. How about Kawakami in the back and forth with Clay Thompson? That's yeah. a lot. you guys are, you guys are becoming part of the story, Sam. Well, that's not the goal, but yes, yeah. uh, those are two good ones. Yeah. Although I hate to admit it, man. I gotta, you're going to make me, I, I got to go dig up the video. I still haven't watched the Kawakami video. You really? Yeah. yeah, yeah I read, yeah. I read his column. He wrote a good column on it. And to his credit, yeah, you talk about him being the story, Tim very quickly, like he actually defended Clay and was like, this is what you want from right. at Clay Thompson. But yes, I need to go see the video. I know that Tim and I like Tim, and Tim's got a little comes off smug at times. I get it; it's fine. Uh, Clay, well, we'll see what you think. But yeah. uh, text me when you watch. I think Clay looked like an ass in the video, and I thought Tim came off very well. So, again, I like Clay a lot. Clay's, I mean, Clay, Draymond. These guys are all like they're you know. Steph's been a little more graceful with it, and it helps when you're playing so well. But and I know we got to go. There's a lot of mid 30s players in the NBA right now really grappling with their own mortality yeah mm -hmm. you know it's it's there's a lot of that right now it happens it happens hot flashes and next thing you know you know all kinds of stuff going on <laughs> wow sam you're the best your, your hairline's in good order dave so you uh, it is it looks good thank you yeah you haircut yesterday nice. all of them as a matter of fact yeah hey sam you know uh speaking of dinosaurs you know one thing they just established yesterday is i don't know if you read the report or not is that the quietest animal in all of the dinosaurs to use the bathroom was the pterodactyl do you know why I'm afraid to ask why. Because the pee was silent. <laughs> That's so really, Sam? It, that, I mean, that was courtesy. That was I love courtesy. It, for it. it was courtesy, but I appreciate that as a, as a fellow dad, dad joke, dad. Love. For what it's worth, as a writer and an alleged journalist, I couldn't spell pterodactyl. <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't is know true. the pee was yeah, silent. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, you're the best. See you next week. Thank you, brother. All right, guys. Have a good weekend. Take Thank care. you. We will uh, take a break. <laughs>